It's so nice to see this many people gathered here today on Musqueam territory, the unceded, occupied, ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. And on a day uh, when many of us are expressing our outrage about the verdict in the murder trial, um, the murder of Colton Bushi. There are events downtown, and um, our speaker is aware of that, and we'll, we'll make some remarks in reference to that. But um, I do want to take this opportunity to underline the importance of the subjects that Erin Manning is bringing to us today, and to tell you a little bit about her. She is the director of the Sense Lab, a laboratory that explores the intersections between art practice and philosophy through the matrix of sensing body and movement. Current art projects are fo focused around the concept of minor gestures in relation to color and movement. She's the author of many publications, including, with Brian Masumi, Thought in the Act, Passages in the Ecology of Experience, and more recently, The Minor Gesture. And welcome, Erin Manning. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, everybody on the team. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I feel uneasy about taking this space at a moment where the, when the march is happening. And I certainly want to let everybody know that if it feels, if your body feels pulled over there, I won't take it personally if you, if you leave. Um, I understand that. Vancouver's a bit difficult to get around in, and so I've been told that even if we left right now, we'd have trouble getting there. Um, so we're not looking at Montreal distances. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I hope I can, um, we can have a conversation together that will be in, uh, in line with perhaps the kinds of concerns that would have brought us together at that march, um, and that there'll be enough time afterwards to manage the, um, the drumming this one? This is mine? OK. Uh, to manage the, the to, to make it to the drumming, uh, which I understand starts at 2. Um, the last time and the only time I gave this paper, I couldn't make it through it. I started to cry. So I hope today is the day that I can make it through the paper. It's a paper I wrote when I handed in my resignation to the dean in March from Concordia University. The dean didn't accept my resignation, so I'm still a professor at Concordia University. But my relationship to the university remains very complicated. Um, and I'd love to talk more about that. I understand the necessity of universities. I was, I was just in, um, in Brazil for a month, and our colleagues in Rio haven't been paid for the last six months in the universities in Rio, the public universities. I understand the difference it made in, in those universities to have um, practices put into place that made sure that certain bodies were no longer as widely excluded from the university. But I can tell you when you walk through Brazilian universities that they look mighty white. Um, what worries me most, I suppose, is the ways in which the concept of accreditation has come to stand in for a concept of thinking. So this talk is called Melodijo un Pajarito, Neurodiversity, Black Life, and the University as We Know It. The first is a quote by Fred Moten and, St and Stefano Harney. But the student has a habit, a bad habit. She studies. She studies, but she does not learn. If she learned, they could measure her progress, establish her attributes, give her credit. But the student keeps studying, keeps planning to study, keeps running to study, keeps studying a plan, keeps elaborating a debt. She studies, starting in the middle. She reads, always, from the outside out. She speaks, stuttering from the edges of language. She fails, her work her work refusing to order itself to the measure she has given. She restarts, the work pulling at her again. She rereads. She knows she should read something new, but those familiar words just have a taste she can't resist. She studies, working from the edges. She reinvents from the middle, 
The form stumps her. She forgets to sight. She forgets that there was a beginning, a place from which knowledge traced itself. She forgets to impress. She doesn't pass. In a private exchange, she writes, quote, and of course the question on ecological ways of knowing and producing may surface, and we listen. I guess it is always a question of limit, scale, and elasticity, a question of an ecosystem that would allow for unattended or decapitated expressivities to come forth. In Spanish, there's an expression that I truly love, me lo dijo un pajarito, a bird told me. My eight-year-old son talks with birds constantly since he was very little. Me lo dijo un pajarito also moves with the possibility of a secret that you know without necessarily knowing in the common way of knowing toward undercommon ways of calling. What are these undercommon ways of calling? The sounds lost, left behind, not only unaddressed but unregistered in the systems of power knowledge we call academia. What cannot be heard? What cannot be listened to? And what are the stakes of the performance of knowledge that plays out in the name of the norm that upholds what is too often generalized around the concept of quality or rigor? Neurodiversity in the university. Creating the conditions for neurodiversity in the university is not about creating a space for difference, a space where difference sequesters itself. It is about attuning to the undercommon currents of creative dissonance and asymmetrical experience already at work in, across, and beyond the institution. It is about becoming attentive to the ways in which the production of knowledge in the register of the neurotypical has always been resisted and queered, despite the fact that neurotypical forms of knowledge are rarely addressed or defined as such. It is about exploring a juncture, a cut I perceive in the here now, a change I want to linger with, that puts the university at risk in the very same gesture that it puts neurodiversity at risk. It is about asking what happens when the turn toward neurodiversity begins to be felt in a way that neurotypicality is truly threatened. In an article called Body Power, Foucault writes, one needs to study what kind of body the current society needs. While the university is certainly not the only site of power knowledge, I turn to the university for this account of what kind of body the current society needs, because it is a site of contestation where the exception often reigns in the name of alternative pedagogies and practices, a site where many of us, myself included, imagine other ways of working and sometimes are even able to activate them. I turn to the university because there is a troubling asymmetry at the heart of teaching and learning practices. On the one hand, creating a path for new ways of thinking and making, while on the other, imposing forms of knowledge that do violence to the bodies they purport to address. I turn to the university because there is of necessity a discontinuity between the individual and collective practices of experimentation it houses and the neoliberalism that undergirds it. I turn to the university because it has been a site of resistance and a site where new orientations toward study have been born, black studies, queer socialities, post-colonialism, disability studies, transformative justice. And I turn to the university because most days I am not at all certain that the site for these explorations and activations of power knowledge is actually capable of the kind of complex work necessary for the decolonization of knowledge, at least not as long as the centrality of the white neurotypical human as purveyor and guarantor of experience reigns supreme. And I should say that for me, neurodiversity is always white. What has shifted in the university as regards neurodiversity, sorry, neurotypicality, I said neurotypicality, right? <laughs> what has shifted in the university as regards neurodiversity is the steady entry into the bounds of its edifice, not only of neurodiverse bodies, but of accounts of what neurodiversity brings. Those bodies that pass have been there all along quote, functioning at the limits of what constitutes the docile body they, we, have been taught to mimic. The other bodies, the ones classically excluded, remain excluded for the most part. But there are exceptions, and these more visible exceptions are troubling what it means to be included in the edifice of learning. 
In the whole United States, there have been nine cases of classically autistic um, folks who have graduated from a university, nine cases. There are none in Canada. They are making themselves heard, teaching us how to bring facilitation into the classroom, reminding us of how inaccessible most of our practices of teaching are, how unaccommodated the non-docile body remains, despite the many academic discourses that circulate supporting its presence. With the writings and movements of these bodies, of our bodies, shared at their pace through the wild library of neurodiversity blogs on the internet, and published more now than ever in the academic presses, we just released a book um, called Authoring Autism from Duke University Press this week by Melanie Yergo, the first uh, autistic who has tenure in the United States. Still understood as guarantors of the intelligibility of knowledge, books that is, have come new propositions for ways of learning, new questions about the relationality of facilitation, expressed always with the confusion about how it is that we could figure pedagogy as being anything but a site of facilitation. It is these interventions, as well as those of artists who write sideways into the academy, making art that refigures what expression can look like, that move the diagram of power knowledge in the institution and mark this moment of recalibration. Of course, the diagram is always mobile and is shifted by more tendencies than those I can name here. The point is not to reduce the undercommons of the university to these tendencies, but to add them to all the others that, like termites, have been eating the walls and reshaping them to their needs. Perhaps one way to speak of this moment is precisely to speak of proliferation, of the inability to name or even to hear all that is at work and all that is at stake. What interests me are these termite-ridden walls and the questions they ask urgently about whether the sites of power knowledge we build and sustain are really equal to those who inhabit them. Spinoza speaks of the institution as a pact, reminding us that what we live in is also what we build and what we take down. What is the pact the university demands? What bodies does it need to survive? What knowledges? The asymmetries the university produces are reflected in the asymmetries of its, quote, we, asymmetries of duration and scale. Placing the power or repression in the individual won't begin to address the complexity of the bodyings that chew at the joints of its foundations. To speak of us, the we, as one, as identifiable, as measurable, would be to underestimate the creativity of our movements. It would make us human, all too human, when in fact our bodyings are transversal, collective, before they are individual, more than. It would also undermine the power of capital that runs through each artery of the institution, connecting to speeds and durations always, also more than human. Any we is always already composing at the interstices of these uneasy collaborations between different valences of the more than. Other approaches are necessary, probably approaches that move at the speed of termites, unbuilding the edifice from within in strategic duplicity with durations more than human. Because trying to accost the system from another angle, trying to break the system from within its own modes of intelligibility, will only in the end reduce us to victims and perpetrators, to humans fir firmly enveloped in a dream of self-sufficiency. We must indeed instead begin with the differential of the more than human that composes us, with the tendencies that make us more than ourselves, engaging the edifice of power knowledge not frontally, but with the very asymmetrical durations that decompose us. Connecting to power knowledge this way may allow us to hear how else knowledge is being crafted on the undercommon edges where a caw can be heard, attuning to modes of knowing that exceed capture. From this perspective, we can feel the dissonance between the rhythm of the work produced in the undercommons and the university's own glacial pace, committed, despite rhetoric to the contrary, to modes of knowing that are all too human. Despite the wealth of work that goes into attempting to alter the system from within, despite the extraordinary research that pushes back against the norms of knowledge production, Despite the resistance on the part of artists to ally to industry, preferring instead to engage in a pragmatics of the useless that explores alternative modes of expression, 
alternative modes of existence, the problem remains. The university is a slow-moving machine. It is structurally incapable of changing at the speed of the thought that moves through it. Power knowledge. Power is never individual. The individual is, at its very most, the expression of a passage, not its operator. These teachings are Foucault, of Foucault's are often backgrounded in analyses of power that would still situate power within the bodies that wreak destruction or suffer its consequences. It is important in thinking the systemic nature of power in the university to clarify how power operates how it is at once ours and beyond a we that pre-exists, how power is a mode of circulation more than it is a targeting practice. Power is what moves through the diagrams that co-compose us. As Foucault writes, quote, the individual is not a pre-given entity which is seized on by the exercise of power. The individual with his identity and characteristics is the product of a relation of power exercised over bodies, multiplicities, movements, desires, forces. To work with the circulation of power, it is necessary to move beyond body to bodying, beyond the notion that there are pre-existing individuals that are powered by a hierarchy that measures their movements. Bodying as a verb reminds us that bodies are a field of forces through which individuations emerge and shift. Bodies are individuating, their, field, their form takings multiple, and differential. How a body individuates depends on the circumstances of its surrounds, on the ecologies that compose it, here, now, on the histories that orient it, on the futurities that give it potential or unmoor it from the grounds of its participation in the world. These orientations toward difference are pragmatic and operative. How a body becomes the body it is here now, the body it is identified to be, also depends on what it means to be a body here now, on the stakes of the form taking, on the limits of that form. Bodies are routinely obliterated at the very point where they individuate into this or that recognizable form. Much is at stake in the shape of individuation there is no doubt that a continuous policing occurs that denies bodies the potential of their transitions, of their becomings, solidifying them from the outside into an identity that cannot be assimilated. I am thinking here of the spastic body, of the disabled body, of the trans body, of the black body, of the lower caste body. There are so many who populate these unassimilable categories. What is important, I think, is to recognize that these captures are occurring because of the threat of bodying. What is terrifying is the very potential at the heart of bodying, the potential for a body to become, to shift, to alter the conditions of life living, life in the register of the more than, life beyond a dichotomy of the human and the non-human. To ask what kind of body our society needs is to take the operations of power seriously and to inquire each time anew how this body how this neurodiversity shifts the field of experience, shifts the terms of power knowledge. Bodying is a process we all engage in. Usually we become a body we already recognize, reproducing ourselves in the image we have come to associate as ours. This is particularly the case for those amongst us whose bodyings are least contested, those whose whiteness, whose neurotypicality already conforms to the mold of what a body should be. When Edouard Glissant incites us to consent not to be a single being, he is reminding us, I think, that the mold of that one form, that one body, should never suffice. That relations are what compose us, relations always in excess of the given, relations as the radically empirical more than that continuously refashions what it means to world. Bodying need not include an alignment with humanism with existing modes of defining what it means to be human. Amelia Baggs in, in, uh, Amelia Baggs in My Language, 2017, or sorry, 2007, perhaps still stands out as the most chilling account in the realm of neurodiversity regarding how non-speaking autistics are excluded from the realm of the human, their personhood extracted precisely because of the breadth of more than human feeling their language, their living, includes. 
In her eight-minute video, in which the first four minutes are spent listening to and smelling and touching the objects around her, and the next four minutes are spent typing on a voice-activated computer, she says, it is only when I type something in your language that you refer to me as having communication. I smell things. I listen to things. I feel things. I taste things. I look at things. It is not enough to look and taste and smell and feel. I have to do those to the right things, or else people doubt that I am a thinking being. And since their definition of thought defines their definition of personhood so ridic ridiculously much, they doubt that I am a real person as well. There is a certain resonance here with accounts from black studies coming from scholars such as Fred Moten, Stefano Harney, Sylvia Winter, Frank Wilderson, Alexander Wahelia, Jasbir Poir, Ashan Crawley, Denise Ferrer da Silva, and others around the concept of black life. Frank Wilderson writes, though it might seem paradoxical, the bridge between blackness and anti-blackness is the unbridgeable gap between black being and human life. Blackness, Moten writes, quote, must free itself from ontological expectation, must refuse subjection to ontology's sanction against the very idea of black subjectivity. This is not to say that black bodies are not sites of power's contestation, but to emphasize that, quote, the para-ontological distinction between blackness and blacks Allows us, to no, allows us no longer to be enthralled to, by the notion that blackness is a property that belongs to blacks, thereby placing certain formulations regarding non-relationality and non-communicability on a different footing and under a different pressure, but also because ultimately it allows us to detach blackness from the question of the meaning of being. Moten. I turn to these voices in black studies to ask whether there isn't an important bridge to be built between neurodiversity and black life, particularly around the question of how else experience could be articulated within the register of the more than, where the stakes are not to measure experience against the worn concept of humanity as defined in the West, but with the force of an ontogenesis that moves in the rhythm with the emergent sociality of bodying, because bodying and sociality cannot be disentangled. And I should say that with more research, this, these questions, of course, are completely allied to indigenous life. The outside. If the asymmetry between power and knowledge concerns the relation of force to form, what happens to knowledge when it begins to resist the very idea of form as final mode of knowing? How is it... How is its force of form altered by the conditions of study that don't hold to the human as central to experience, that heed indigenous and black and neurodiverse and queer forms of knowing? What does knowledge look like when it has become unmoored from its capture as form? Foucault speaks of, quote, a new type of relation, a dimension of thought that is irreducible to knowledge. This dimension of thought, this outside of recognizable knowledge is not new. It already exists. We hear it in the stories passed down through generations as told to us by indigenous scholars. We feel it in the care for material practices as shared to us by African-American quilt makers. We hear it in the break where, quote, that shit breaks down, Moten. Thought irreducible to practice moves outside the registers of categorization, shifting the conditions of under common ways of calling. We don't need a university for this. In fact, the university often closes down the registers of sociality this kind of study needs to thrive. The outside is the name Deleuze and Foucault give to the circulation of forces at, at the heart of power's operation, where thought remains irreducible to knowledge. The outside is not the exterior as opposed to an interior. It is not spatial, it is intensive. The outside is what remains unthought in thought, what remains unfelt in feeling. It is what accompanies all emergent relationalities, what moves with all social life in the making. Quote, the outside concerns force. If force is always in relation with other forces, forces necessarily pertain to an irreducible outside which no longer has a form, 
made up of non-decomposable distances where one force acts upon another or is acted upon by another." End quote. Power works from the outside, but never from the outside in. Quote, it is always from the outside that a force confers on others or receives from others the variable affection that exists only at a given distance or in a particular relation. End quote. Deleuze. An outside without inside is a force without a form. Form is a constellation of effects that body here, now, in just this way. While there is no question that power also contributes to how a form taking occurs, Foucault's insistence on the importance of the outside is a reminder that power always also carries an excess, a more than, that is not captured by the form itself. Quote, there is therefore a becoming of forces which remain distinct from the history of forms since it operates in another dimension, end quote. Bodying is an example of this. A body is a coming into itself that orients the effects of power toward a certain taking form. What makes it a bodying is that this taking form composes with registers that are rife with other potential orientations. Bodyings are not simply form takings. They are an, the activation of the force of form toward emergent shapings. These emergent shapings have histories and genealogies and futurities. How they come to be what they are, here, now, matters. But this just now is always also more than the shape it has momentarily taken. Consent not to be a single being. Move the relation. The outside is an intuitive concept for the more neurodiverse amongst us. It is what accompanies all experience in the making what leaves those traces that still vibrate on the edges of what we call objects. In the edgings into experience, the colorings of time, the echoes of futures on the cusp that interrupt that chunking neurotypicals continuously seek in their search for categories. It is the world that isn't quite there before the chunk, the world that accompanies without quite situating itself, a kind of continuous refrain that orients the not quite of all form takings. It is the intensities that sound that so many don't seem to hear, those intensities that are continuously getting in the way of the human voice, that privileged sight of human expression, the intensities that whisper to us that the world is lively and living beyond the space the human takes. The outside is not where our teachings have focused, though those of us who teach art have an affinity for it, perhaps. We may speak in terms of hunches, of feeling, of affect, of tendency, of force, all of these synonyms for that which participates but cannot be circumscribed. This is not the knowledge we've been taught to recognize, not the knowledge of forms already captured. The outside is not the formed matter, the segmented, the archivable. It is the anarchic share that of strided knowledge the share of experience which resists scripting, yet nonetheless affects what the script can do. Anarchival knowledge, neurodiverse knowledge, is not outside form so much as, as in the cleaving between form and force. It is what calls knowledge back to its edging into experience. It is the diagram, the force of form, of knowledge, where knowing meets unknowing. When knowledge begins to escape stratification, when its form begins to blur, its anarchic share surfacing, its alignment to power also shifts. Power and knowledge begin to compose differently. It's not that knowledge is no longer irreducible to power. Foucault's point, after all, is that this irreducibility is what gives the potential for resistance. It's that the irreducibility begins to scintillate in ways that give knowledge that breadth, the force to subvert the striations that usually constrain it. Perhaps at the point of scintillation, knowledge is no longer the right term. Study is a better term, or research creation, before it got taken up by neoliberalism. These are thicker concepts, I think, for the texture of what I'm trying to gesture towards when I speak of knowledge's unknowing. But for now, I want to hold on to the possibility that the term itself, that knowledge could still be carried forth as that, as that which has the capacity for doing the work differently, 
if only to emphasize the trouble neurodiversity brings to the academic institution, trouble that most often erupts around the question of who knows how to know. Emergent socialities. The emergent collectivity of worlds remaking themselves through knowledge's yield creates socialities. Language is one way those socialities express themselves. Speaking of the zone, the social zone of blackness in the context of the undercommons, Moton and Harney bring forth a distinction between the social and the political. About the Black Panthers, they write, the Panthers theorized revolution without politics, which is to say revolution with neither a subject nor a principle of decision. Against the law, because they were generating law, they practiced an ongoing planning to be possessed hopelessly and optimistically and incessantly indebted, given to unfinished contrapuntal study of and in the commonwealth, poverty, and the blackness of surround. For Moton and Harney, the social carries the outside in a way the political can't partly, can't partly because politics already knows where it stands in relation to black lives and indigenous lives. The social is what can still be fashioned, a social not of existing subjectivities, but of emergent socialities, emergent ways of encountering the aesthetic yield of experience. Emergent sociality refuses representation. It produces not a constituency, but a fugitivity. As force of the outside, sociality is not what already exists. It is what is crafted in the relation. Neurodiversity, and particularly autism, is often referred to as the most asocial of modes of living. It is a sign of our neurotypical human-centeredness that we only feel heard when we have eye contact, when the body we are speaking to consents to be a single being, excluding its more than human tendencies. So much meaning is given to the way attention is oriented, pay attention that we rarely stop to think of the violence of those frontal modes of attention, like this one, that force us to block out the scintillations of the world and its many qualities of attending. If we have any autistics in the room, I'm sure you've noticed the shifting of the light. When the neurodiverse amongst us listen, they listen to those scintillations. They are moved by them, hearing the more than that echoes across the threshold of the sensory. Sometimes, this is just too much. But always it is there, moving amodally across the bodying activated by the relation. This relation is not only to me, to you. It is a relation to the world as it has come together just now, here. A relation to the field of experience making itself. Eye contact is ridiculous in this context. Ridiculous because it misses so much. There is no emergent sociality in the pressure to pay attention in just this neurotypical way. Emergent sociality is a listening with the array of potential socialities in our surrounds. Moved by the outside, it asks that sociality be invented anew each time, that the world and worlding become the occasion for study. When autistics are framed as a rhetorical, it is usually around the concept of sociality. Melanie Yergo writes, my flapping fingers and facial tics signify an anti-discourse of sorts. Where is my control? Where is my communicability? Would anyone choose a life of ticking? How can an involuntary movement, an involuntary neurology, a state of being that is predicated on asociality, how can these things be rhetorical? In the neurotypical model of sociality, the measure is always that of communication as direct exchange. I speak, you look and listen. Then you speak, connecting your thoughts to mine. When this doesn't happen, when the encounter doesn't read for the neurotypical as communicational, the response is depersonification, dehumanization. Quote, autism is frequently storied as an epic in asociality, in non-intention. It represents the edges and boundaries of humanity, a queerly crip kind of isolationism. We, the autistic, are a peopleless people. We embody not a counter rhetoric, but an anti rhetoric, a kind of being and moving that exists tragically at the folds of involuntary automation, 
Our body minds rotely go through the motions, cluelessly, da di da. Melanie Yergo. Cluelessly, la di da. Me lo dijo un pajarito. The free indirect. Emergent sociality edges into experience as the force which unmoors expectations about the relationscapes that compose us. It speaks from the corners, from the ledges and edges and thresholds of experience still taking form. It flies off the body and with sparks. It stims and ticks and hollers. It melts down when the world is just too much to take, the tensions of the world speeding like lightning along the body's feeling, always feeling surfaces. The world is too much, and yet it is lived fully again and again to a limit unconceivable for most neurotypically inclined. Neurodiversity invents life, life living. The invention of socialities is a study in living, a living study. It speaks often in pronouns intermixed. It is not unusual to hear autistics speak of themselves in the third person. A cold coming on, Adam Wolfund writes, I think my body jumps because I am feeling sick. I think I have a cold in my boy nose. I am really wanting razor sharp, always feeling body to be very calm and I want the body to wash away like the water you use. I want the water to always give me answers about how to stay quiet in my body. My body is always trying to stay calm. Talking as you do is away from the way my not very calm hated body talks. Hated is calming way of Adam and always questioning and asking people. At once I and end quote. At once I and Adam and boy, Adam and the cold co-compose, water the teacher that may give the directions to ordering the body within neurotypical parameters. Because having, being a moving autistic body is dangerous in a neurotypical world. Not only will it get you sidelined, as unintelligent, as deviant, if you happen to be autistic in black, it may also get you killed. The stakes are high. The body must stay still and words must come out in the order in which neurotypicals can hear them, can order them. Pronouns must be adjusted or we will be seen as stupid. This is something I've heard often. And yet no language proceeds directly. This is what Deleuze and Guattari teach us in their chapter on linguistics in A Thousand Plateaus. Me lo dijo un pajarito is how the linguistic utterance actually functions. Knowledge, as it moves through language, always comes sideways. Language, write Deleuze and Guattari, is not content to go from a first party to a second party from one who has seen to one who has not, but necessarily goes from a second party to a third party, neither of whom has seen. Heard from the sidelines, what is it about language that makes us believe that it is direct, unmediated? It is the order word that does this work, ferrying the free indirect into the semblance of direct communication. An often redundant structure of language, the order word is what organizes the potential disorientation of the free indirect quality of language, providing the utterance with a history of directions. Quote, an order always and already concerns prior orders, which is why ordering is redundancy. When the schoolmistress instructs her students on a rule of grammar or arithmetic, she is not informing them any more than she is informing herself when she questions a student. She does not so much instruct as in sign, gives orders or commands. A teacher's commands are not external or additional to what he or she teaches us." End quote. Speaking in the free indirect, catching language in the making, the order word is carried in the performance of what the instructor does not actually need to say. The school, its habits, the teaching expectation and pedagogical format enforce a certain organization of knowledge that moves through the free indirect to give it the form of a command, here, now. It is not language that constrains knowledge but the order word that moves through it. In the manyness of language, order words are the mechanism of orientation that keep language in check. For Deleuze and Guattari, the order word is, quote, the ele elementary unit of language. Quote, we call order words not a particular category of explicit statements, for example, in the imperative, 
but the relation of every word or every statement to implicit presuppositions, in other words, to speech acts that are and can only be accomplished in the statement. And yet, quote, there is no individual enunciation, there is not even a subject of enunciation, right, Deleuze and Guattari. Enunciation is deeply social, even when spoken in solitude. It is not only that language carries histories and futurities, but also, and especially, that language speaks through us, across us. In this sense, language also makes us, our bodyings alive with the sociality of expression. This is the case whether we use the words or not. Amelia Baggs makes this abundantly clear. There is language without text. Language is also movement, sound, texture. This is Deleuze and Guattari's point. Emergent socialities speak languages on the edge of decipherability, where what moves is not the order word, but what they call passwords, collectively invented and then forgotten. Language can never quite be captured. Quote, there are passwords beneath order words, words that pass, words that are components of passage, whereas order words mark stoppages or organize stratified compositions. A single thing or word undoubtedly has this twofold nature. It is necessary to extract one from the other to transform the compositions of order into components of passage. End quote. We've all felt it, the joy of a new concept, a password for the creation of worlds, the taste of the thinking it creates, the force of the movements it allows. When allied to language, emergent socialities are collective assemblages of enunciation, agencement collectif d'enunciation. The French is necessary here to mark the specificity of the concept of agencement, often lost in translation. It's translated as assemblage. Agencement is not a form in any sense of the word, neither is it an arrangement. Agencement assembles, it is the movement toward, the orientation that creates the conditions for a, pro for a process to take. Collective assemblages of enunciation are machines of language, mobilizers of potential that motor expression toward articulation. They remind us that the content of language can never be abstracted from its expression. Sociality before and between, in the relation. Free indirect discourse has no intrinsic morality. This is why its sociality must be invented each time anew, and why the collective assemblage of enunciation it crafts must be tested for what it can do at each juncture. Concepts are only as good as the living they create, more than human. Quote, it's been said that Oh, sorry, it's been said that, or, but this is how it's always been done, or, as three people told me, our indirect discourse is everyday weapons. Order words are infinitely cunning in their ability to appear where you least expect them. And if you count on a single password, you will get locked out, stuck under the weight of past usage, the concept no longer operative in the current landscape. New landscapes will always require new concepts, or at least new ways of creating conceptual passwords. It takes practice, but what beautiful work it is to make language sing, to hear language's abysses, to move to its ticks. This is also the power of its indirect discourse, to include what has been excluded, to make room for the minor gestures of sociality which, over time, may be capable of shifting the register of what can be thought, of what it can mean to know. Order words are less language than the condition for, quote, the superlinearity of expression, Deleuze and Guattari. They are only one of the ways language is, language is moved from its field of potential to its pragmatic instantiation, here, now. We must not be cowed by them. But to make the turn toward the conceptual work of creating living passwords, we do have to train ourselves to hear the undercommon ways of calling. Because the neurotypical mode of listening always hears the human voice before the call and almost never hears the undercommon ways of calling. As autistic Dana Crummins writes, most people attend to voices, human voices, above all else. I attend to everything in the same way with no discrimination so that the call of the crow in the tree is as clear and important as the voice of the person I'm walking with." End quote. 
The order word is, communication that does not fit our model is no communication at all. Deleuze and Guattari speak of making, making audible, non-sonorous forces. Moved beyond the register of the order word, language begins to do something else. It begins to make heard the non-sonorous forces that populate it in the ways of knowing that curb it toward modes of sociality yet to be invented. Under common ways of calling trouble order words and the matrix of signification that keeps them intelligible, they do this all the time. What happens if we begin to listen? More than human. What is it about the stimmy, ticky, or spastic body that threatens neurotypicality? What is it about it that so readily reads as unintelligent, unknowing? Is it its unabashed excess, its uninhibited wealth of expression? Is it the fact that it makes felt the breadth of intensity signification never, can never quite capture? We know that bodies get in the way of learning, of knowing, of speaking. Otherwise, why would we have to sit in chairs all day and stand still when we speak and stop to pay attention? Is that why neurodiversity is so threatening to neurotypicality's certainty about what it means to know? Because neurodiversity bodies language? Is that also what is so threatening about black life, that it moves? That it moves sound, language, life in ways as yet uncharted? How does a poetics of blackness, Denise Ferrer de Silva's term, connect to neurodiversity, to neurodiverse life? Gesturing toward decolonial ways of living, of writing, a poetics of blackness, quote, announces a whole range of possibilities for knowing, doing, and existing, writes Ferrer de Silva. What kinds of emergent socialities are invented at this interstice? Emergent sociality is an ecology of practices Always more than, always more than human, emergent sociality moves at the speed of the unformed that courses through the formed. What we hear at the interstice, the anarchic share of experience that accompanies experience in the making. Wuhelia writes, black life is that which must be con con constitutively abjected and as such has represented the negative ontological ground for the Western order of things at least for the last 500 years but can never be included in the Western world order, especially the category of man. Phrased differently, there can be no black life in the territory of Western humanist man, which is why the existence of black life disenchants Western humanism. A similar account moves through the writings around neurodiversity. Quote, Autistic bodies, these are bodies that, do, that not only defy social order, but fail to acknowledge social order's very existence. Autism then poses a kind of neuroqueer threat to normalcy, to society's very essence. Melanie Yergo. A more than defies the concept of the human in both cases. A more than that deeply unsettles the human as he is defined by the white discourses of neurotypicality the human as the omnipresent category that holds dominion over knowledge in every walk of life. Who speaks the order word of the human? From whom do we hear it? The more than moves experience, its shape unsettled, it can't be counted, it can't be known as such, but it matters. It matters in that it qualifies, orients, thickens, and textures experience in the making reminding us that the human is a junction, an interstice toward a certain quality of shaping, of speciation. This speciation is a diagram, a field of forces that activate a set of relations through which certain becomings can occur. This diagram is a mode of survival as much as it is an orientation for the creation of new modes of existence. For the ways in which power and knowledge agitate on its vectors has effects as regards what else living can be when life is no longer organized by the neurotypical diagram that places man in the center of the panopticon. The diagrams for life living activated by the emergent socialities of neurodiverse life are never perspectival. The diagrams are always askew, asymmetrical, unbound by forms that would constrain them. They are wild, anarchival, messy. 
These diagrams fashioned of knowledge always still in the making invite us, inside us, to connect to how else we can unknow, unown the language of the order word as it has been passed down, neurotypical generation after neurotypical generation. Fred Moten asks, is there knowledge in the surface of not knowing, of study as unowning knowledge? The unknowing, the unowning of knowledge takes courage. An abyss awaits where passages have not yet been invented in the ruins. The university is in ruins, I heard. Me lo dijo un pajarito. The university is in ruins, she said. That colonial space that didn't allow my voice, that didn't hear my cry, he said. It was just too human too full of subjects, too disciplined, too corporate. It couldn't survive. Moten and Harney. The student has no interests. The student's interests must be identified, declared, pursued, assessed, counseled, and credited. Debt produces interests. The student will be indebted. The student will be interested, interest the students. The student can be calculated by her debts, can calculate her debts with her interests. She is inside of credit, inside of graduation, inside of being a creditor, of being invested in education, a citizen. The student graduates. Pursue bad debt. Study beyond credit. Except the university is still there, and she still has debt and no credit. And we're still teaching, still hiring, sometimes, still investing your debt, still paying my mortgage, still distributing my grants, still organizing my calendar, still calling meetings. I hear the cry. They don't pass. The work they do is not accepted as knowledge. I see no research here, I am told. This doesn't look like work. You are not supervising adequately. You are not doing your job. I've paid my debt, and now I have credit, and I'm afraid of losing it, aren't we all? But I can't stand it. I can't stand the measure of value. And so I study. I learn to study in the undercommons of the university. I have never learned so much, never studied quite this way. I am a student. I know some of us will get through. I am a professor. I made it through the gates, past every single hurdle, until I hit the highest ceiling. I thought it would protect us. I thought it would make it possible for me to squeeze you through the membrane. But they didn't let you through. We didn't let us through. In the end, we are the termites. We eat away at the structure, residing in the holes we create. They are warm, and we can nest. There is some comfort here. But at night, when we scurry around the hallways, listening to the anarchive, I hear echoes of other modes of study, and I hear you hear them too. All along, listening to you, I was thinking about the relationship between writing and what you were talking about, and um, the way that writing has been captured by the very structures you were talking about. Yeah. So, if you could entertain a few reflections about the craft, mm. about the way you go about it, mm. and about the value Mm. of writing. Mm. I mean that decidedly after mm. listening to your last remark. Mm. Um, I, think it would, I think it would be very helpful. It's mm. a great question. Writing means everything to me. Um, and I, I'm destroyed by what the university does to writing. Um, and the ways in which we keep telling students that they can get to writing after. Just do the non-writing now. 
get the grants, get your PhD, then you'll learn how to write, you'll be able to write. But the problem with that is that there isn't an after. And um, so while on the one hand I don't want in my own work to make writing the, the mode, I have a lot of students for whom writing is not the mode. And we've worked really, really hard at Concordia and research creation in the humanities PhD to make it more and more possible not to have writing be the mode, and certainly not to have academic writing be the mode. I want there to be room for the unknowability at the heart of writing in the sense that we could throw each other something that we almost can think and then we would pick that up where we could get away from this nauseating world of critique where we're just sitting there trying to find the holes in other people's work or, or checking to see whether their parenthetical citations meet our parenthetical citations, whether their in-group is our in-group. So I want to fight for writing and I want to fight also for reading. I should tell you that I was invited for the first time in my life in Amsterdam next month um, to read something I've already written. And, and that is something I've asked myself for years. Why do poets get to read the writing they've already done? And we academics have to pull out the next text or beg the people that we're giving talks for not to put it on YouTube tomorrow morning so that we can actually give the paper again. So but part of what I'm also thinking is that in this particular academic year, I will read work that I've already written. And, and to practice the reading as a listening and to honor the non-PowerPoint presentation. And this is not to speak against visuals, but to also give us a place of listening where we can daydream, right? Where, where you, hopefully there's a rhythm there that can go with the quality of the light and you don't need to hear. So anyway, obviously I feel strongly about this. And I, and I, I mean, I, I wasn't telling a speculative story. My students are not passing. So I'm not telling a story that is um, light. You know, this is, th what I'm suggesting is not going to help you necessarily, but it may keep you alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a question from the floor. Um, I'm interested in knowing how are you able to enact these different ways of knowing for your students? Um, and first of all, and really thank you for your writing. It sounds really poetic. Like, it does a lot for daydream, like, to be in it and still be paying attention to other things. Um, and you validate so many things that I've been thinking about. So how do you make space for that? And do you have any tips in terms of, even if you're not um, on paper, you're said to be um, neurodivergent, but how does one, like both those things, so what are you doing with your students and how does one stay alive and progress? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, hopefully you'll tell me the second part. Um, okay, yeah, it's a great question. Well, first of all, I never teach in rooms um, that are frontal. Um, the frontal relationship, like the one here, is very violent for people who are neurodiverse because it emphasizes the face over everything else. My, m I don't believe there is such a thing as a neurotypical person. I should make this clear. Neurotypicality is kind of like whiteness. It's, um, it's a structural um, orientation that organizes knowledge. Um, the, so everybody would be on a spectrum of neurodiversity. But, but most of us, if we're sitting in this room, pass quite well. Um, also in the movement for neurodiversity is, are included um, schizophrenics, bipolar, um, I've written about depression. Um, so neurodiversity is a movement that wants the complexity of a non-cure rhetoric with medical assistance. This is what's so important about neurodiversity, that it is about facilitation all forms of facilitation. And so I try, first of all, to create a space for facilitation. And what that looks like really changes, depending on the people who are there, and their children and their animals, if necessary, and the light coming in the room, and the time we have. So very, very pragmatically, I always include a hiding place or two. Um, literally places that you can hide in. Um, behind a couch, in a tent under a table, places where you can 
not be seen, but be, be there to participate. And I can tell you that once you begin to create hiding places in your classrooms, they will be the first occupied. Um, and then I make sure that I don't, I don't organize the threshold, like the door, so that when you enter, somebody can directly see you. If you organize a room that way, a lot of bodies will never cross the threshold. Um, I'm familiar with, in my case, classrooms where the um, black population is an extraordinary minority like maybe one person. So I try to think a lot about what that feels like to cross that threshold. What does it feel like for an indigenous person to cross the threshold? Um, is there a way that a person can sit right next to the door with a good line of sight to be able to leave? Uh, make sure that there's a, a way to move sound to places that are very far away from where I sit. Um, I never, um, I, we don't have any desks. Um, but there is a table, and we allow the table to be the lure for those who need the table. It's not a terribly popular place, I should say. It's interesting that the table doesn't tend to be the place that attracts people most. I also leave an open-ended um, class time and try to allow for a lot of silence. I'm not very good at it. It worries me. I count in my head um, to try not to panic. <laughs> Um, and and uh, I try to allow for more one than one more than one form of um, media in the room. So I encourage people. I have speakers around the room, and I encourage people to play sounds if they feel the need for sound, or or to you know move the classroom. And then the last thing I do, and this is particular to my particular my my practice as a philosopher, is that I never use words in the room which we don't talk out loud together. So every text that's in the room, we read it word by word together out loud. And we talk only in the words that are on the page in front of us. And that allows us to not create these hierarchies in the classroom be between those people who have access to language easily or who can easily mobilize conversation. Um, and so what happens in the classroom with me is that those people who are very neurotypically oriented hate my classes. That's okay. There are lots of classes for those people. And um, I make it very clear that I won't penalize people if they don't have to come. The final thing I do is that I allow anybody to come on Skype. So if you can't make it into the room for whatever reason, you can be on Skype. Um, in the last year and a half, um, part of the reason I've been connecting so much with Brazil is that my Skype classroom has been very full of Brazilians um, because of the situation over there, and and so I, I and I honor those those forms of participation as much. So I'll correct a work from anybody, whether they're actually getting credit or not. So those are the m most ways that I do it. How do I survive? Well, I'm, I overperform um, because the truth is that in order to be able to do that, um, I get a lot of resistance from colleagues. Um, they don't like. They don't like the, the, the unknowability of it. Um, some do. I get support in, in strange circles, but I don't always get support. In fact, I most often don't get support. But I'm now a full professor, so I'm less fragile. Or at least I'm supposed to be less fragile. Um, but I do think that the university requires us to be overachievers if we want to create those spaces or want to perform in those spaces. So. So a lot of us burn out, and uh, when I wanted to leave the university in the spring, it was because uh, one of my students, his defense was blocked. And the external had sent a glowing report, outstanding, but the university, the, my colleagues blocked it, which was illegal. They weren't allowed to do it, but, but I felt like if I can't do that at work, I don't want to be there anymore. And um, because the only thing I'm in the university for is to meet these extraordinary people who go to university. So, so I'm not sure. We survive collectively. We invent ways together. We read each other's work. We make art. We, we remind ourselves that we learn not because of universities, but, but um, in those junctures where we can come together, some of which are universities, I guess. Sorry if that's not. Have, you know, thinking about ritual, not just as um, uh, 
forms of doing without knowing. And I think you were talking about it particularly in the context of making art. But I was wondering whether you think of ritual also in your work of creating passwords Nobody's ever asked me that. That's a great question. Um, just for those of you who might not know the, the work on ritual, um, so I'm also an artist, and my artwork is uh, very, very slow. Um, and I've always wondered about why it's so slow. It's not my temperament. My temperament's quite fast. Um, and I suspect I, I do quite slow artwork so that I have something to accompany me. Um, it keeps me, keeps me feeling like I have, a, I have, I have work to do. Um, I mean, the kind of work that matters to me. And so in the minor gesture, I was thinking a lot about this strange moment that we're in, the century we're in, in contemporary art, where, where we make these objects that are very allied to ritual, and yet the contemporary world doesn't care for their afterlife. And, um, and what is the afterlife? And I know, I know that as an artist, it can be the most demoralizing experience to do an artwork much more so than writing a book. It's the weirdest thing. When you write a book, you really do feel like it's in the world somewhere. You don't know where it is, but it has liberated you to write the next book. At least that's how I feel about it. It just sort of feels like, oh, that's gone. And, but an artwork is a different kind of beast. It, it sometimes feels like the, com the putting out of the artwork is, is the end. And often there's quite a lot of capital that goes into it. And, um, and then you know, you're sort of forced into a kind of an archival re relationship with it, which is um, conceptually something I'm not comfortable with. So anyway, I, I think about, uh, I thought a lot about ritual in relation to that, and I think you're absolutely right that I just hadn't seen it, that, that the ritual practices of creating those passwords is very much what I'm busy with across the making and the thinking. I'm, I am the kind of scholar who needs to be in the studio to think. So all of my writing, I suppose I should have said that, comes from making. Um, whether it's as a dancer or as an artist, I, I begin there. And there's, a, there's generally a place where something happens and I need to write. I'm, I'm in a making phase right now and I, and I honestly think I might never have anything to say again. It, it always feels like an abyss. And then suddenly there's something to say again. I mean, so hopefully it'll happen. Um, but it's like I, I need to go into those gestational periods where I'm working materially. And, um, and I think that um, at the Sense Lab, a lot of our work has been, we, we, we articulated in, in relation to techniques and enabling constraints. So we think about what are the techniques that allow um, a, 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 an event to be more than the sum of its parts. This is sort of what we think. So, so the threshold, for example, is a technique we've been working on for the last 15 years. What, where are the thresholds? Which thresholds do we miss? Who crosses them? How are they crossed? And so we try to invent techniques. And the inventing of techniques, we've come to realize, has to be embodied as a practice. You can't come once. You actually have to do this work. And you have to figure out how to do it. And you do it at home. You do it in the way that you parent. You do it when you go to the grocery store. You do it in your university life. You do it. You just do it. And, um, and then you're sensitive to, to what its afterlives are. So, so yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. But thank you. That's nice. Well. I think we're all mulling over the rich, rich talk we just heard, so let's give Erin a round of applause.